What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my thoughts on the Mass Effect trilogy after reviewing each of the games of Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 in the Legendary Edition. And I wanted to take a step back and kind of talk about the trilogy as a whole and how things evolved and kind of what I saw. So right at the top of the video here, though, ton of spoilers, obviously, going to be talking about all three of these games. I'll try to post a link to the reviews down below if I remember to do it. That way you can see my specific thoughts about every title, as here we're talking about the broad trilogy. And secondly, this might be a tiny bit rambly. I have a few categories of things I would like to talk about, but I'm not scripting this nearly as much as my normal videos would be. But I do have some general topics I'd like to cover, so I might wind up time stamping this anyway. All of that said, let's actually kick this off. So the map Mass Effect trilogy is overall pretty interesting. Now, I, again, I had not played it previously. It was one of the biggest holes in my gaming knowledge and pretty much completed the games from Bioware that I had not played. At this point, I think it's pretty much Andromeda and Anthem I haven't touched outside of like one or two of their random little games. So with that said, it was really interesting to see the progression of the gameplay as I went through each game as Mass Effect 1 tries to be at least partially an RPG. Now, I mentioned in the review of Mass Effect 1 that I still thought it was pretty light on the RPG mechanics, which to put that in perspective to the games I normally play, I do believe is the case. Though that said, this is a channel that focuses primarily on things like CRPGs, which are all about the RPG. But moving forward to Mass Effect 2 and then 3, you can see them clearly shift focus to being more of an action-oriented title. And Honestly, I think the games were better for it, as Mass Effect 1 tried to be two different things, an RPG as well as the shooter, and it came out to be a bit of a mixed bag, whereas the focus direction of Mass Effect 2 and 3 made it a better game overall, even if by the time you get to Mass Effect 3, I would barely call it an RPG in the terms of its mechanics. Now, it is obviously an RPG in the broadest sense that you are playing the role of Commander Shepard, but semantics. Now, the reason I found that so interesting is having played almost every other Bioware game, you can, as they release games, see a very clear trend and shift towards more action-oriented style gameplay as compared to their earlier titles, which were actually very much so hardcore RPGs like the Baldur's Gate game. Around this period, the late 2000s and early 2010s, they very clearly shifted towards more action-oriented stuff. Now, a lot of people will, of course, attribute that simply to the fact that EA bought Bioware in 2008, which pretty much lines up exactly with it timeline-wise, so make of that what you will. I'll save that for another video, probably after I play Andromeda, and then we'll talk about the progression of Bioware in that sense, but I did want to mention in this video that there's a very clear progression in that direction. But with that said, let's actually talk about the story of each individual game, so this will be our story section, if you will. Now, Mass Effect 1, I think, is probably my favorite of the three story wise in that it's pretty cohesive like all of it's together so we're of course fighting Saren who has been indoctrinated by the Reapers who Commander Shepard finds out are in fact not just a galactic boogeyman but are a real and serious threat and throughout the game we learn that a Reaper Sovereign who is controlling Saren is trying to find a way onto the Citadel to manually activate the Citadel which then acts as its own giant mass relay for the Reapers to begin their invasion and wipe out life on the galaxy. Now I want to talk about that for a second because in my recent Mass Effect 3 video it came up. The Protheans, who are the previous race that the Reapers wiped out and are a subject of the entire series, but their ancient civilizations have been studied. But the Protheans, while they were not successful in defending themselves against the Reapers, what they did manage to do is find a backdoor onto the Citadel and reprogram the Keepers. The Keepers are a sort of docile sentient race that always take care of the Citadel. The Reapers genetically engineered them for this task. And previously, the Reapers, when they left the galaxy every 50,000 years, would leave one Reaper behind to signal the Keepers when they were ready to activate the Citadel's mass relay, which allows the Reapers to then jump into the galaxy. However, the Protheans successfully stopped this from happening next time, which means in the current cycle, or Mass Effect 1, the Keepers never responded to Sovereign's signal to activate the Citadel in this way. So Sovereign has to manually go to the Citadel to do it himself, which is the conclusion of the game, where you stop Saren and 
sovereign from being able to do this, which effectively slows down the invasion, but does not stop it. As now, because of this, the Reapers are forced to travel through dark space to the galaxy, which is going to take some time. And it winds up taking several years. And I mention that because jumping forward a little bit, there is a plot hole in Mass Effect 3, where after the Reapers have been invading the Milky Way and attacking all over the place, towards the end of the game, they randomly just teleport the entire Citadel. However, if the Citadel is the invasion point for the Reapers, because with control of the Citadel, they can shut down all of the other mass relays, which effectively stops inner space travel. And being close enough to the Citadel allows them to just teleport the thing to them, apparently, or just assault it in mass. Why didn't they do that before the end of Mass Effect 3? It's just an annoying plot hole, and I mention it here because people tried to say that the reason the Reapers couldn't go there and then turn off the mass relays was because the Protheans had already reprogrammed the Keepers. But again, the plot of Mass Effect 1 shows us that this just means they have to go there and do it manually. Annually, which they are capable of because it's their technology. Now, there are ways the developers could have wrote around this. It just annoys me that it never actually made it into the game, and it's a plot hole as presented. But that's enough about that. That, of course, brings us to Mass Effect 2, and Mass Effect 2 is probably the strangest overall in terms of the story, as it feels a little bit disconnected, and I have some questions that, again, I don't feel like were answered. But Mass Effect 2 sees the Collectors an alien race, which are heavily modified Protheans controlled by the Reapers, acting with a sort of insect-like hive mind, are going and just abducting entire human colonies. Shepard actually dies at the beginning of this one, is reincarnated two years later by Cerberus, a terrorist organization that actually showed up in Mass Effect 1 if you were paying attention to the side missions. Cerberus wants to do something about these abductions, so they resurrect you, Shepard, and they put you to work trying to stop it. And the Collectors, as it turns out, at the end of this one, are trying to build the next Reaper. We find out that the reason the Reapers invade, or at least part of the reason, is that they take the species that they harvest and they turn it into a Reaper. Which is cool enough, but... The actual narrative of this game, too, was probably my favorite game overall, to be clear, but the narrative of this game, I felt, was a little odd in that they didn't answer a few crucial questions. Like, we know the Collectors are working for the Reapers, but it's never explicitly stated why. You could presume that it was because the loss of time caused by the delay of the Citadel not being able to be immediately shut down and them having to manually travel there. Maybe they're using the Collectors to get a jump start on the process, but again, that's never explicitly stated in game. And from the outside looking in, it seems like that would be a problem for the reasons of exactly what happens. It's caught wind of, and then they put a stop to it. Whereas you're kind of ruining the element of surprise for yourself if you're the Reapers at this point. And you could argue that that's kind of already been lost with everything that happened with Sovereign, but officially in the game, it's all been covered up, etc. And maybe the Reapers just don't care at this point, but it's just odd and they never explain specifically why they're having the Collectors do this when they could just do it themselves when they get there. But the Reapers that the Collectors are trying to actually make is a human one. And interestingly enough, it actually has like the skeleton of a human, which is only noteworthy because all of the other Reapers look a very specific way. And while it is visually pretty cool and gives me Terminator vibes, they never really explain why they were building this thing in the shape of a human skeleton. Because again, that's not really the case with any other Reaper. And I assume this is probably just a plot thing that they decided to rewrite at some point. And while I honestly, I think it fits perfectly fine in the broad narrative, it's just kind of curious. It left me with some questions that the game never really answered at any point. Now that brings us to Mass Effect 3, which drew the trilogy to a close and we see the Reapers finally attack. Now, overall, I liked Mass Effect 3, and my problems with the story outside of the plot hole that I already mentioned was that it was kind of a bummer to see Cerberus actually reduced to just generic bad guy because Cerberus throughout the series up to this point had been more morally gray. They put humanity first in the terms of like other galactic species. And in Mass Effect 2, you're actually working for them and you're trying to stop the abduction of all these colonies by the collectors, which the rest of the world, including the official human government, just won't do anything about. However, in Mass Effect 3, they are everywhere and they are your generic bad guy. They are who you are fighting most of the time. And the story does get around to explaining this. It 
it was just a bummer to see a faction that was more complicated than that be reduced to just a guy to shoot, really. And then, of course, there's the endings. I don't think you can talk about Mass Effect 3 without bringing up the endings, which I did pretty extensively in my review, so I'm going to leave it there. Broadly, though, a little underwhelming, but not as bad as I was expecting. Now, while the overall narrative of Mass Effect is honestly pretty good, a few things here or there that I just kind of noticed as I was playing through, which, I mean, let's be real, as you develop and work on three different games, things are going to change as just, you know, the nature of game development happens. So I would have never expected that to be perfectly cohesive anyway. And in terms of video game plot holes and continuity issues, it's hardly the worst defender. And I say that as someone who got this channel started by covering Divinity lore primarily, which is an absolute mess. So honestly, not that bad. But one thing that really stood out to me throughout all of the games was actually the world building. And one of, I think, the best things about the Mass Effect trilogy was just the world in which it takes place in, because the world feels complete almost immediately. From the very first game, you see pretty much everything. And then in the later games, they kind of expand on specific points and they show more of like each particular alien's culture or how they interact, that type of thing. But from the very beginning of the series, that first game, it already feels like they had wrote the entire world. And as such, in terms of the world building, everything kind of works out. And in that way, it's actually really fun to go around and kind of explore some of this through the stories presented to you, especially with Mass Effect 2 when we start getting into all of the various loyalty missions of each of the companions, which then usually explore some aspect of the galaxy at large, like the Arda Yakshi, or the political machinations of the Quarians. There's just a lot there to love, and again, all of that stuff is referenced from the very first game, and then we see it expanded upon later, and in that way it felt really good. While we're talking about that, I did want to talk a little bit about the choices that are available to our character, as Mass Effect is is, quite a bit, a game about making decisions. However, I think the choices when it comes to the series are a bit of a mixed bag. Some of them are not actually choices. They're an illusion of choice. For instance, you can choose to make Captain Anderson a counselor at the end of Mass Effect 1. However, by the time Mass Effect 3 rolls around, it turns out that the game decided that the other guy was the right choice, and Counselor Udina, who you could have picked, becomes the counselor kind of no matter what happens. And you actually see a couple instances of that kind of thing throughout the title, where they present something as a big choice, but then the effect of that is pretty non-existent. And it kind of feels to me, combined with the relatively short dev time of all of these games, that they clearly had a direction they wanted to go, and they didn't want to have to sort out the resources, basically, to iterate upon every possible instance of those choices. And so they just didn't. They were like, well, this is what happens. And it kind of narrows it all back down and makes it more streamlined in that way, which as a result kind of has the feeling of making some of these choices not really be choices. And then in Mass Effect 2, for instance, depending on your choices actually throughout the game, a bunch of your companions will either live or die. And in that way, the consequences of that and how you approach that actually feel very substantial because if they didn't live, Live, then that changes what plays out in Mass Effect 3 quite a bit. And while the situations in Mass Effect 3 will stay largely the same, whether or not a companion is alive or not can have an impact on those. So there's an effect that you can see in a later title. So it's a real mixed bag between the two. Uh, on one hand, there's a lot of choices where the impact or effect is going to play out in a specific way regardless of what you choose. And then there's other things where the impact is actually very substantial, at least in the overall feel. Which brings me to the Paragon and Renegade systems of all three games. So this is something that, ironically enough, kind of also got streamlined as the games went on. As in the first game, it was more of a stat-focused kind of thing almost, where you would build up Paragon or Renegade, and then that would unlock a higher level of Charm or Intimidate for you to invest points into. Whereas in the later games, it became more of a raw score that would then just decide whether or not you pass or fail the check, or can pass the check, I should say. However, the later games also introduced interrupts, which allowed you to take Paragon or renegade actions directly during more cutscene oriented type stuff, which honestly was a nice touch. It kind of felt like you were interacting with it in that way. And it's a little thing, but I enjoyed that part. 
But I would say the overall effects of Paragon or Renegade were a little disappointing to me as largely what it affects is the behavior of Shepard, which is nice in that, you know, it kind of lets you define the character a little bit for what is otherwise a set protagonist. But a lot of times when you're presented with either a Paragon or a Renegade choice, the fundamental outcome of passing one or the other is ultimately the same. And that's not true in every case. For instance, in some instances, a Renegade choice might just kill someone one, whereas a Paragon will save them. But oftentimes, when you are presented with the actual hard skill checks for Paragon and Renegade, the outcome of those tends to be very specific, regardless of which one you pass. So overall, my thing with the Paragon and Renegade stuff is just that I wish they had taken it farther and given it more effects than it had, which is why when it comes to choices in this game, just broadly speaking, it kind of felt like they were just afraid to give the character control too much in a way that kind of feels like they were afraid to have to spend the development time working out the effects of those choices. So in some ways, it feels like they give you the illusion of choice pretty often. And anything that would stray too far from the broader narrative they're trying to tell, they just didn't want it to happen. That brings us to arguably the entire best part of the series, actually and that is the characters and companions. Now, we're not going to cover these guys in depth, just kind of broadly talking about them a little bit, as I will do a separate video talking about each of the companions and ranking them, which I'm sure everyone will love and no one will have a single problem with. Honestly, the companions are done in a fantastic way, and even characters that you interact with regularly who aren't actually companions are done really well. And while the plot of some of the games has a bit of weak writing here and there, in my opinion, the strongest writing in these games is for the characters and companions, as the character development of almost every single character is done really well. There are a couple here and there that I didn't really care for, such as Caden. If you play a male shepherd in Mass Effect 1, you don't really get hardly any interaction at all with Caden. And then if you keep him alive and carry him forward to Mass Effect 3, where he actually can join the team again and then has more interactions with you, he's like, oh, I'm so glad we managed to come out and be friends. And it's like, dude, I hardly know you. So there are the occasional character like Caden where I actually just don't think they got enough screen time and they feel a little forced, whereas that stands in stark contrast and is much more noticeable because all of the other companions are done so well in this regard that the one or two that don't get as much attention kind of stand out as a result for being lackluster compared to how well all the other ones were done. And then the other thing that I personally ran into is I found a hard time finding a lot of the human companions to be very interesting because you're in this really cool world with all these really interesting alien races that they give you as companions. And personally, it's like, do I want to hear about the space cop adventures of this grizzled Turian? Or do I want to hear Caden complain about how his implants are the older version? And it's just kind of hard to relate to the human companions as interesting when you've got these alien alien species on board. That's just something I ran into. But Overall, I think all of the characters and companions really had their own personality, and they develop as characters across the game, especially the ones that you carry from Mass Effect 1 all the way to Mass Effect 3. You get really attached to them and see them grow and change and potentially even die across the series, and it's hard not to get very attached to them. And that is the thing Mass Effect does very, very well, is it manages to get you attached to their characters through the character development, which is actually done really, really well. But to draw this to a bit of a close, as I've been going on for quite a while now, the Mass Effect trilogy is such an interesting part of video game history, because on one hand, it marks a very obvious progression towards a more action-oriented focus from Bioware, but you can still see a lot of the love that they had for the characters and the universe. And I guess more than anything, I kind of want to have seen what they could have done with more time and resources, as some of these games were developed in like less than two years. But even so, they're a pretty integral part of just the history of video games at this point, which is why I was so happy to finally go back and play them and kind of fill in that gap in my knowledge. And for every fault I can find about a Mass Effect title, there's like 10 other things that the game did really well. And while personally, I'm still going to prefer my much more heavy on the RPG mechanics, CRPGs and isometric games that I love so much, all you've really got to do is play through the Mass Effect trilogy to see why they are so widely beloved. 
And overall, it's been a fascinating journey that I enjoyed quite a bit. There you guys go. I hope you enjoyed my kind of extended thoughts across the series, just about various things and topics, and just kind of some of the lingering stuff I didn't feel like were covered in any one specific review, but rather my thoughts on the trilogy itself. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.